Okay, so hi, I'm Ben from Benadec, and this is about low latency engineering, high frequency trading. Anybody knows what high frequency trading is? It's so, algorithmic trading using the. Very good, very good, thank you. Otherwise, it's great. So, you might learn something today. Okay, so you might have seen in films that in the distant past, uh, traders did trading on exchanges by shouting at each other and phoning on the phone and they just oh, buy this, buy that, buy that. So that, that was trading and it was very a manly thing to do. And very, uh, so some time ago, long time ago, they figured out it's much, much more attractive and they look smarter if they don't shout at each other, but instead just look at screens and do the same thing. So that's how electronic trading was invented. So instead of shouting at each other, they shouted at the computers. Not so soon after that, they also realized that if they can do the trading via computers, perhaps computers can also do the trading so they can focus on the more important things instead of actually doing the computers. So algorithmic trading was invented. So by that point, the computers did the trading while traders did something else. Okay, so these computers here nicely illustrated are trading engines. So they are computers that run a program that listen to events on, on the exchange, more or not later, and based on those events, they do some processing and execute orders. And these trading engines need to be really fast. Nodding, but the question is why? So we have to first understand why we need to be really fast, otherwise we might do something that's actually not needed. So let's discuss why we need to be fast. So let's consider that you want, you're hungry and you want to buy some bananas. So you have two stores in your vicinity and you want to buy bananas. So you go to the first store and see that they sell bananas for $10 a kilogram, right? A bit pricey, but being a very to-do, carefree developer, you decide to buy bananas. So he asked the keeper to give me a kilogram of bananas, and he says, sorry, we're out of bananas. Okay, not taking that personally. He decided to visit the other store, and by walking there, someone over overheard you in the first store, and this guy knows that you want to buy bananas for $10. So he runs ahead of you, this is called literally front running, and he gets to the other store first. And that store sells bananas for $9. Yeah, very cheap, right? And he buys the complete stockpile. So by the time you get there, and that's for bananas, that store is also empty. But at the front door, there's this guy selling bananas for $10. So you buy your bananas for $10 a kilogram, refunds the other one, uh, whatever he, uh, remains with him. And there's a story. So you got your bananas for $10. You're happy, but you're also scammed, right? So you're oversold. Do you think this example is forced? This happens every time with, with concert tickets, where the tickets are not for tied to the person. It also happened to a particular children's uh, soft shell clothing sold by a Hungarian um, food store recently. So it happens. People buy up stuff just to sell them for more, more expensive. So that's why uh, trading engines need to be fast, because the same thing happens on electronic exchanges that's called front running. And there are several other, other cases that trader needs to protect against. This kind of arbitrage is one thing. There are others. So you have to be as fast as possible. So, and that means this is all a constant uh, arms race. There's no limit that you breach and you're fast enough. You'll always have to be faster and faster. So that means a lot of work for us programmers. Okay, so we know that we have to be fast. What does fast mean? So it's very important to be, be precise. It might seem trivial. Okay, a computer is fast when it does what you do immediately, but there are multiple definitions of fast. There are metrics, different metrics. So let's just be precise and, and define that we have a system, this trading engine, which takes inputs like signals or requests and responds to them. Then we can, now we can define on this model a few metrics that we can call, that we can correlate somehow with being fast. So one is throughput. Throughput means the number of requests you can process and respond to unit of time in a second. So requests per second, that's throughput. Also you can define latency, which is 
time it takes to respond to a single request. And these might seem close to each other, right? Almost the same, but they are not. They are very different under the hood. And it is very important distinction because web services, for example, that serve web pages, usually optimize for throughput. You want to serve as many clients as possible. It doesn't really matter if you serve them in half a second or second, if you serve a million of clients, right? That's how web servers are configured. But trading engines are quite different. For trading engines, it's very important to be as low latency as possible. So it's in the expert trading engines in the 20 microseconds range from wire to wire. So you get some signal and in 20 microseconds you have to respond to something. And you have to be also very uh, jitter free. So you, the variance of your latency must be low. Otherwise, same, same problems happen. Okay, so we know that we have to be fast and fast means low latency. Okay, so the question is how to reduce latency because let's suppose that we already have something, what to do with that? Obviously, the first step is buy more expensive hardware. So buy better CPUs, more memory, better network cards, whatever. This quickly gets very expensive. And not just the CPU, the top of the line CPUs are very expensive, uh, but also specific network cards that does things that only needed for trading. Locations that are close to the exchange gets very expensive very quickly. Um, Rented lines for exchanges are very expensive. So this is something that you could do and you should do if you're in, in that um, business, but it really quickly gets expensive. Second one is operating systems. Probably can use anything, but I've only seen Linux so far. So probably it's Linux, and uh, we're not going to talk about that, but there are several old test tuning guides how you want to change the parameters of your TCP stacks to be as, as low latency as possible because the operating system you get is probably not tuned for your specific use case. Might be tuned for web services because that's the more the bigger market. But low latency is different. The third layer is the language and the ecosystem you are using. Um, I would say something that's as close to the hardware as possible as as practical, probably C++ or Rust, probably something that doesn't use garbage collection because garbage collection stops your program and that might result in big jitter. You might try Java, people tried it, it might work, but you'll just fight the ecosystem all the time. So the best if you choose something that's for the test. So it's usually C++ or Rust nowadays. And on the top, that is the application. That's what we are going to talk about because because that's what I'm doing and I don't really understand the other parts. And uh, the application is, is a place where you can get a big win for little effort. So that's where you really want to start because even if the most expensive hardware, if your application sucks, it's just not going to be fast. So that's that. Okay, let's suppose you have an application already that does something, that's usually the case. Let's suppose that it's correct, that's never the case. And let's suppose that you can run to do something. Let's pretend. What to do then? You have something, you can run it on your computer. What? Do random changes. No, never. Never do random changes. That's the worst you can do for two reasons. First, if you do a random change, you'll never be sure if you actually made your stuff faster or it just happens tense, or it just made faster today, but tomorrow it's going to be slower, or for different use cases it's going to be slower, so first. Second, even if it gets faster, nobody will know. Your manager will not know. Your management chain will not know. You'll not get promoted for something that you can prove. So, first step, always measure. Always measure and see what your application is doing today. So, a couple of ideas. Very important. First, if it's still in the early days, you have something that's uh, low hanging fruits all over the place, just use time. Time, run your program and see how, it, how quickly it executes. Try changing stuff and see if it gets faster. This is quite a blind stuff, but with some practice, you can already pick up some low hanging fruits. After that, there's a slightly more uh, refined way. Perf is a very nice tool if you don't know, it's Linux specific extremely useful. 
perf stat, this repeat five will execute your command five times and show you some details of how long it took to run and also some counters that you can, with some experience, we can say that, that okay, this program is CPU bound, this program is memory bound, this program has problems with fetching instructions, whatever. So this will give you an idea. After that, next one is proper profiling. So perf record will run your application as you specified it, you wrap your input, and interrupt your application periodically, quickly, like a thousand times a second. And each time it interrupts the application, it will save something that will be able to give you a stack trace. So you run your application, and you have a bunch of stack traces. And these stack traces, a sampling, can be used to have an idea where your application usually spends time. Okay? So after that you have this sampling, you just run perf record G, and this is the output you get. So on the console, you see, oops. At that point, you see that this application spent time in the read function, 26%, and it was called, or it's calling those, those frames. So it is, can be used to have an idea of where you're spending time. And you start from the top and go to the bottom. You can invert color colleagues with a different flag. And that way you have an idea, okay, so this is the application, but we are spending time here, so we need to fix that part. If you, that part is fixed, then you can get to the next part, whatever. So this is really, really useful. And, um, right? and here you can see something that you can generate from that report. So you have your sampling, and you can combine your stack traces into a flame chart that looks like this. This is uh, an example from RipGrab that searches text and files, and you can, the stacks are combined by common ancestor. So you have, you see that this function was calling that function and that function, that function, and you have an idea how your stack frames relate to each other in terms of time spent or, or sample accounts. This is very useful because now you've seen that you might want to reduce the number of reads you do because that takes a lot of time. Okay. So this is something that uh, um, you can do. And after that, low latency optimization is a bag of tricks. So usually you go by reducing system calls. Not sure if you know what system calls is because they're not your, your background, but everything on the computer nowadays almost that does wants to interact with the operating system that's usually done via system calls. And the system call is expensive for certain reasons, so you want to minimize that, like read there, you want to do less of them as if possible. If you get rid of the system calls in your hot path, then you need to probably need to uh, reduce the memory allocations because that's also something that might be costly. And also the memory allocations you want to reduce the memory copies, that's the zero copy ways to copy as little memory as possible, reuse the same buffers, don't copy them all, all over the place. And then you want to optimize your um, cache usage, so use as little memory as possible, don't optimize your data structures so they fit in a single cache line or whatever. And, and that's how it goes, so you start with the usual uh, heavy stuff and then just go more, more and more refined things to optimize your latency of your application. I also have brought you a uh, case study for completion, but before we do that, I'd like to let you ask questions if you have. No questions, good. I liked speaking. Okay, so case study, something that I did in the past and uh, I think it's, it's interesting. If you don't think, then you're proper. Okay, you, this application has one thread that does the actual import and load test stuff, computes something, computes, computes, computes. It also sends some telemetry data to another thread via queue, because this telemetry data is used by the users of the application to understand how this program actually works. So strings. So there's a thread that computes something, and there's a channel, and this thread sends strings over to this thread, over a queue, and this thread just does something like Right, sent to network, doesn't matter. And uh, it was reported that this system is slow. Okay, then make this faster. So I got there and say, okay, this queue is, this is a slow one, this starts locking or whatever, so I ported different queue I made in the past and just put it there. 
this is a faster queue, it doesn't, it's a log free queue, it's going to be faster, good. We deployed it, numbers came back, it was faster, nice, I was happy for a day. After a day it was reported that the overall system is now much faster, but there are peaks in the performance, I mean in the latency. So no, 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 normally it's okay, and there's a peak, and it's also very fast, and there's a peak. Okay, what's going on there? I was puzzled. So I got to get there to the running application and use strace. I'm not sure if you know strace, that's a tool that you can run on the application and list you the system calls that application is doing. And uh, it told me that this that the main thread does a Futex system call that is on Linux a way to implement mutexes. Okay, so this thread does mutexes, it does some locking, that's, that's the piece, right? So something is wrong there. So we went to the code and browsed it and, wait, there's no locking here. So went back and confirmed, like, okay, there is some locking, but not in the codes. Where is the locking? Where is it? So this thread just sends strings over a lock-free queue and blah, and there is locking. And fortunately, Ashtrace also tells you the address of the footex word that's being logged, so something, a piece of memory that the lock is implemented in. And it was a very peculiar address because it has a lot of zeros at the end, plus 20. And this number of zeros was quite also unfamiliar and familiar at the same time because usually user space stuff doesn't have that many zeros in them. But I was sure that I've seen this number somewhere. I mean, this was heavily aligned address. And I looked at the glibc uh, memory allocator documentation and it told me that arenas that the glibc memory allocator produces are aligned to like 8 megabytes, exactly that my address is plus 20. And these, these arenas have a lock at their beginning, so wherever you allocate memory, you allocate it from a pool. That's what this application did, I mean the main thread, all created strings. And strings are heap allocated, so they allocate memory somewhere where the string is contained, and they put the strings into the queue. And the other thread just casts the string out of the queue, writes them to network, and then destroys the string. So the memory is being freed, and the memory must be returned somewhere to the heap where the first thread allocated it. Normally, allocation is lock-free because it just put, you just get something out of it and then put it back, but if two threads use the same heap, and you can't do it otherwise because this, this piece of memory was allocated from this heap, so you can't return it somewhere else, you have to return it there. Then there's going to be a locking because two threads are using the same heap. And this locking, when this thread pulled out all the strings, brought them to network and it was destroyed them, that's where they had a fight over that lock and that's what, fight, what resulted in peaks. So that's an example of the kind of stuff that low-tensity engineers need to face and I think it's a very interesting and challenging place to be, and um, that's that. Thanks for your time, and thanks for coming, and thanks for waiting for this next test many times. And uh, sure, no questions. Thank you. Have a nice evening.